a too high level for me to expect you to kind of be able to reproduce this. On the other hand, if you find doping interesting, I have a few pointers for you. Uh, if you just go into Google and search for my name and add Academia, then at the top here you get a link which you can click on and you find my Academia page and as an experiment last year I made some um, uh, I made some research videos See on the left here there's something called video research presentations. If you go in here there are four videos here which kind of uh, sums up a lot of my work within doping. I've spent a lot of time researching doping actually so if you find this interesting of course this is a quite a much higher mathematical level than we have done here but uh, if you're interested you can have a look here. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with academia.edu? It's a very interesting page. A lot of Open access research is available for everybody to look at, so you can search for everybody, anything, whatever here. And it, it's a, a nice place to, to find information, actually. But um, here you see it's... Um, yeah, hopefully, if you click here now, something would happen here. Yes, it seems so. Oh yes, there's no sound. There is a video here, it seems, and you can go to YouTube and see it there. Yes, you can. You can change the resolution here. Yes, you can. Okay, so you see, that's me again. But, uh, when we move along here, I will start uh, talking about some papers. Okay, here you can see there is some. You see this RNC, you recognize those, don't you? But there's uh, more of them now, so it's, it's a different setting. Okay. Exercise 2. It's a long text here. I don't think we need to spend uh, all the time in the world to, to translate it. It's, it's about penalty kicks. And as opposed to the model we looked at in the textbook, we make a small change here. And that change is the following. Instead of looking at this strategy space, We look at this strategy space. Oh, that should perhaps be right. That should be left. So we explicitly open up for writing for shooting to the left or the right hand side. Of course, the same for the keeper. He can actually choose to not make the choice of standing or moving, but now a, a triplet choice: either standing, moving to the right, or moving to the left. So we kind of extend the strategic space from a 2 times 2 space into a 3 times 3 space. That's the only difference in this exercise. So this is explained in the text here now, okay? To make it simple, we, we could say that if the executor shoots right and the keeper moves to the same side, so we can I think what I do here is that they say that if he actually moves left, I call that right in order to keep the same ones, to, to kind of make it easier, okay, to not have to, to look the opposite way when the, the keeper actually moves to his right. So it's when the keeper moves right, it's right from the angle of the executor. And then they, when they both choose R, then they are kind of in a position where the keeper can save the shot. So that is something which is done here, which kind of made for simplification. But the main point of the exercise, you see the structure here turns out to be slightly different. If you look at the utility structure, it's the same as in the textbook. No change there, but of course as there are three strategies for each of the players now, suddenly of course this matrix that originally was like this now is extended. And of course we get these structures here along the diagonal and then we get some possibilities here. You see I have kind of introduced this opportunity of missing the goal here. So this is not the simplest version like we looked in the textbook. So, uh, but you also probably see that the P and Q has changed places here. Okay. It was a Q here in the original one. 
now it's a p and then so what is a p here was a q, is a q in the textbook just to confuse you a little bit okay it's kind of done deliberately so in this case i've given the matrix and you're asked in a to discuss whether this seems to be correct so what was the answer to that What about these P's here? Do you think they are sensible? Have you looked at this? No, in, in, they should not be sensible. Okay, it's, uh, uh, what's happening here? When we are up here, the executor shoots in the middle of the goal, and the keeper moves. So these, if these should be sensible, this P should mean that he kind of saves with his legs. Okay, but uh, I don't think the model opens up for that. So it should be a one here and a one here. Okay, that's actually an error in this this one here. Again, as I said, this is what I do at exercise level, not at exam level. Okay, so just to don't don't worry. Okay. You will see when we go into the exam exercises that it's much simpler than we see here. So there are some differences according to the model in the textbook. P and Q have saved there is an error in the matrix. Um, and of course, the main difference is that we move from a two strat strategy space into a three strategy space. That's kind of the big difference. And then, of course, in order to find the Nash equilibria here, you have to kind of make the same type of assumptions as we did in the textbook. And it uh, kind of ends up with uh, this P must be bigger than zero. So you get circles here. Uh, and you have a 1 here, this 1 is bigger than both these two, so you get the circle here, you have a 1 here, then this 1 is bigger than the P, and P. so you get the circle here, 1 is bigger than 0, so you get the square here, this 1 must be bigger than those two, mustn't it? Because it's 1 minus P, 1 minus P, and then you add something, so this 1 must be the biggest in this line, so you get the square here, the same here, you add PQ, 1 minus P, plus something must be bigger than these other two, so you get the square here, and you end up with the same type of situation, with no pure strategy Nash equilibria, again meaning that there must be a Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. So you see, the idea of this exercise is kind of to, to tell you that if we make our very simple original model more complex, it doesn't really change the basic structure. So you end up with a game where the fundamental logic, as we kind of see it intuitively, that the keeper must not guess where we shoot, and we must not guess where the keeper throws himself. Okay? In that case, we know how to get the goal. So that kind of structure is preserved, even if we make the game slightly more complex, as in this case. Uh, there is a C there, actually a double C. It should be a single C, it's a typo there where we make some assumptions about P and Q here. And we, we change them such that P equals 1 and Q equals 0. And this is kind of the opposite situation of the extreme case we looked at in the textbook. Because P equals 1, one means that all shots hit the goal. So there's suddenly no possibility for the shooter to miss the goal. Remember the case we looked at in the textbook was the opposite. Then uh, suddenly the, the shooter always missed. Okay. So this is kind of the other extreme. And Q equals zero means that the keeper doesn't save any shots at all. And what happens then is that we get a whole pile of Nash equilibria, which are pure strategic. Turns out, you can look at the solution, that all these elements then suddenly are Nash equilibria. So this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Because now the keeper doesn't save any shots. This, what does this say? M? Uh, it's hard to see. Yeah, this is M. And then it's, this is, of course, Norwegian Venstre, which is left and Heide, which is right. Okay, so. so, of course, if the keeper only saves shots by standing, then you never shoot in the middle. Then you always shoot to the side, and as long as you never miss, you will always get a goal. Okay, so any kind 
a wide shot here, either left or right, will produce a certain goal, and consequently, the sensible executor will understand these by analyzing these games. So this is the opposite situation of the, the case we looked at in the textbook. Exact opposite, so to speak. So in that case, we had a very bad executor and a reasonably good keeper. Here we have a very, very bad keeper and an executor who always hit the goal if he shoots wide. That produces, of course, the optional always shooting wide. And then, of course, any kind of Nash equilibrium where the executor chooses wide, either left or right, would produce this goal. Of course, he would avoid doing this. So this is not a part of the Nash equilibrium. Any kind of solution in here will produce this goal. And then finally, you should discuss the sense in this answer. Of course, the sense is not there because there are no such keepers and there are no such executors. If, there was, if this was the situation, we'd have to change the penalty kick rules. Okay, if the, you had shooters who were always hit and so bad keepers, then there wouldn't be much point in having a keeper, at least not in a penalty shootout. And a keeper who never saves any penalty would perhaps not save many other shots either, so it, it wouldn't really correspond with reality. And of course, this is kind of what we're discussing in D here. Discuss the model in relation to reality. Of course, the same problems as we discussed when it came to reality holds in this case as in the previous case. Even though this model is slightly more complex, it's not that much more complex. There's only three options from the strategy, strategy space. Of course, there could be much more. The rule itself is questionable when it comes to whether it's a simultaneous game or not. So all these, the same kind of arguments holds here as they did hold when we discussed this in the textbook. Okay. Let's move on to exercise 3 instead. That's a slightly more interesting exercise. Where we move into a territory where we haven't been yet. Okay, so now we look at a free kick. A football team, it's even in English, has been awarded a free kick at shooting distance from their opponent's goal. Assume that the attacking team A, the team who got the free kick, considers two possible strategies, a direct shot DS or a variant with the pass PV. Okay. Again, of course, simplifications. Yeah, there are many ways you can perform a direct shot. There are many ways you can do a pass variant. We kind of look at only these two distinctly different ways of performing a free kick. And that roughly covers most free kicks, doesn't it? Either you try to shoot, or you try to pass. But of course there are very different types of passes. You can have these free kicks where you kind of show the ball high into the goal. You can pass on the field and so on. So there's, there's different ways of doing this. But roughly they kind of sums up the main differences here. Either to try to go for a direct goal or to use a pass variant. The defending team, which is named D here, also considers two possible strategies. Either they could build a wall, you know what that in means? Putting up players in front, which stand still. Uh, or they could not build a wall. In general, what you see when you watch football is that this wall building seems to be the way to do it if the shooting distance is relatively close. It's very seldom that you see teams not building a wall if the shooting distance is from 25 meters and in. I'm not sure whether this is sensible, but okay. Something we can discuss when we move on here. Payoffs for team A is defined by the simple fact that the attacking team prefers either a situation with a direct shot if no wall is built, or the opposite. Do you see what I mean there? It's better for the attacking team to shoot if there is no wall. Okay, that seems sensible. Okay, they, they like that. But uh, then, of course, they also like the opposite, which means that if there is a wall, then they, they are more in favor of performing this passing activity, which is kind of logical. Both these outcomes are assigned payoffs of 2. All other combinations are negative for team A and are given a payoff of 0. So this kind of defines the payoff structure for the attacking team. So these two pos positive parts produces a positive payoff of two, and then there is nothing to gain from these other situations. 
we can always discuss this. The defending team considers the outcome of a direct shot without a wall as the worst. This kind of corresponds with our feeling of reality. We, we, we see all these walls, don't we? So it's a, a situation where you kind of force the team to take off the wall if the shooting distance is 20 meters or something. Seems like a dangerous situation. So, so they um, don't like that situation at all, at all. So they assign a payoff of zero for this alternative. The case of a wall and a pass is also considered bad, but somewhat less bad. Okay, so there's a payoff positive of one there. The two remaining cases, direct shot with a wall and pass and no wall, are considered the best with payoffs O2. Then, in question A, formulate the game for the above described situation and address concepts like sequential, simultaneous, perfect, imperfect, and complete, incomplete. The latter parts you haven't learned about. Okay, so this, this one and this one is something we haven't discussed in this course. So this is kind of out of the curriculum, so don't care about that. We can still do parts of exercise A. So, let's look at this. We discussed this already, didn't we, that if there is a free kick, it should be a sequential game. Okay, so we need to look at the game tree here, so let's try to, to make one. And who are making the first decision here? It's the defending team, isn't it? They will have to decide whether to put up a wall or not. And then the attacking team can observe whether it is a wall or not and make their decision. And their decision is either to make a wall or not to make a wall. So W here means build a wall, while N W means no wall. That should be straightforward. And then the attacking team comes into a decisive phase here. And there, you see, I sometimes use these script letters when I put uh, players into to kind of separate from the others. They could choose a direct shot or a pass variant. These D, S, and P, B are given in the exercise, isn't it? I don't know whether this W and N, W are given. Yes, it is. W and W. So we are uh, kind of given you the, the links to how to do this. Of course, the same up here, PB and DS. Let me just take out these penalty kicks here to make room for the latter parts of the exercise. So now we have uh, drawn the game tree here. Now we need to look at the payoffs. And the payoff structure is given in the text here. So it's a matter about decoding the textual information of these two and one and zeros, which kind of was, was given in the text, and put it on the right place here. So let's do something like this, and let's put the attacking team here and the defending team here. So here are the payoffs. Now in this case, there is a wall here and a direct shot. That was not preferred by the attacking team, was it? They didn't like to shoot when there was the wall. They preferred the other situation. And, and according to the information, it should be a two here for the defending team. When there was a pass variant in the wall, this was nicer from the point of the attacking team. Of course, the reason is that when you have a wall here, a lot of players are engaged in the wall. So this opens up for better passing opportunities, doesn't it? That's the whole point. There are more players to pass to, which are not covered up by those who are in the wall. Of course, the more people are in the wall, the, the more passing options are available. So this is nicer from the attacking team. The defending team, they was kind of in the middle on this one. It was kind of given a, a difference here. Uh, when there was no wall and a direct shot, of course, that was very nice from the attacking team's point of view because then they could shoot freely at the goal and only the keeper will have to be mastered to get the goal. And the opposite here. So these numbers re reflect the information given in the text, basically. Of course, this is something you will have to kind of perform at an exam, being able to decode the textual information description and put it into a game. Unless I'm very nice and give you the game figure instead and ask you to comment on it. Okay. So now we can use 
our back rolling procedure, which, which often is referred to as the Cermelo algorithm, by the way. I didn't, don't know whether I've told you that. But when you backtrack these game trees, by kind of maximizing here and maximizing there, then you kind of do something which is often is called as performing a Cermelo algorithm. It's named after a Swiss mathematician called Cermelo, who actually did some very early game theory work in the 1920s. Maybe the first serious game theoretist, I would say. Okay, so we start at the back here, on the top here, and look at the attacking team. They could choose a pass variant that produces 2, they could choose a direct shot that produces 0, 2 is better than 0, so they would double mark this branch. Then we move down here. Uh, if the defending team chooses no wall, they can choose either a direct shot that produces 2 or a pass variant produces 0. 2 is better than 0, so we get a red line there. Then we backtrack to the start, and the de defending team could choose a wall. If they choose a wall, the attacking team choose a pass variant. In that case, they get 1. Alternatively, they can choose no wall. In that case, the attacking team chooses a direct shot. They could get zero. One is better than zero. Okay, one is bigger than zero. So they would prefer this one then, wouldn't they? Now we have performed B. We have found all Nash equilibrium. There's a single one here, and it states the following. The defending team build a wall. So we assume here that there is shoot shooting distance, okay? So, but that seems reasonable. That's what we see. But the next part of the Nash equilibrium is not what we see, is it? Because we see then the response from the attacking team should be to use a pass and not to shoot. Discuss the following statement. The above model explains fully why we always, almost always observe wall building in free kicks at shooting distance. It seems to do that, doesn't it? Because the Nash equilibrium says a wall should be built. But there is some problems with this model, isn't it? It, uh, it doesn't produce the results we see in reality. Why is the reason for that, do you think? Difficult question, perhaps. There must be something... Uh, wrong with the model, don't you think? The, it, it's too simple. Okay, it's, uh, it doesn't kind of reflect the real payoffs, perhaps. Maybe it's more advantageous, maybe it's a bigger chance of getting a goal if you shoot, no matter whether it's wall or not. You must per perhaps put in some probabilities here. So it's much more difficult to make a pass variant work. So the distance between these numbers are perhaps not what it should be. Okay, and, uh, and uh, that is, of course, one way you can think when you make a game theory model. You can say, OK, I would like to mimic reality here. And I know that the, the Nash equilibrium I observe is this one, OK? Not this one. So I should have, OK, then that means that I need to look at these numbers here. It should be the opposite way around, shouldn't it? It should perhaps be. 2.1 here, or something, so that I get these flipping up here. If I do that on the other hand, then I get a 2 there, then I get, then it seems to, to work. Do you see that? Then it works. Okay, because then the next stage, then, if I have a, a line here, that one is bigger than that one, then I get 2 up here on the defending team as opposed to 0, and 2 is bigger, so then I get these as the Nash equilibrium. So that works, but of course, this is too silly. You have to put some logic into this. Okay, so this is kind of a reverse engineering way of doing game theory, which of course you can do, but it's perhaps not what we recommend. Uh, the basic, the best way to do this is kind of to make your model in the right way in the first place, and not kind of make the result you would like the model to give to kind of govern your model. But it's possible, as you can see. It's kind of a trick. Okay, so what's left? There is a final exercise here. We are given a table with two 
teams N and B and they have some strategies N, B and A N and A for the N team and B and N for the B team and there are some probabilities this is probably captured from the textbook it seems to be this Brazil no Norway game no it seems to be the Belarus Norway game actually table 4 describes uh, imaginative football match between the teams N and B. Le uh, team N can choose strategies in the strategy space N A, while team B can choose strategies N B. Explain the meaning of table 2. Is it reasonable to assume that one of the teams is better than the other? The meaning is as follows. Okay, We here assume that each of the teams have a strategy space to choose from and given that they choose once the one team chooses one strategy and the other team chooses another strategy then we assume that the outcome of the match can be described probabilistically by a probability distribution and by assumption we assume that if you change these strategies these probabilities also should change because they kind of reflect the outcome of the match is it reasonable to assume that one of the teams is better than the other? Yeah, maybe it is. Let's look at the probabilities here then. Uh, the N team here has a probability of 0 0.8 of beating the B team, while the other way around is 0 0.1. So in this line, they are. it's obviously that the N team is better than the B team. Okay, These probabilities are much higher than that one. If we move down here, we see the same. 0 0.4 is bigger than 0 0.2. But here they are equally good, and here they are equally good. Okay, so. It seems uh, reasonable, in my opinion, to say that the N team is better than the B team, but because for half of the strategies, they actually have better probabilistic possibilities, while they are kind of equally good in these other two. So that is the answer to the A question. And then in B, explain how the information in table 2 can be converted into a game matrix or a game table as shown in figure 2. So there is actually a figure here. So the conversion has been performed and your task is just to explain how these numbers are computed. And that's straightforward, isn't it? It's just to to see at the number, for instance, it should be 2.5 for this N B strategy, the first line here, and of course then you probably see immediately that if you take a point score system of 310 means 3 times 0 0.8 plus, if you look at the N team, they would get 3.0.8 plus 1.0.1, .1, and that is 2.4 plus 1.0.1, which is 2.5, which corresponds with uh, the correct number down here. And of course, if you are pedantic, you could do this for all these numbers. That would be very nice, but I'm lazy, so I say that's enough. Okay. It's up to you to choose what you do on the exam if this is. Okay. So then we have explained how this information comes up. You just calculate expected point score values given a certain point score system, which turns out to be the 310 in this case. Uh, for each of the team and for each of these four lines that produces eight numbers, these eight numbers are entered at the correct place in this double table. That is one way of answering this question. Find the Nash equilibrium in this game. What is the interpretation of the circles and the squares in figure two? Okay. So here the best reply functions have been calculated. We can check that they are correct. Uh, 2.5 is bigger than 1.45, and this is circular. 1.6 is bigger than 1.33, 1 point is bigger than 0 0.4, and 1.45 is bigger than 1.33. And the circles are the best reply functions for player 1, n in this case. The squares are the best reply function for player 2, Belarus in this case. And the best reply functions are their optimal choices as a function of their opponent's choices. So we find this 2.5 by assuming that Belarus chooses their first strategy, the B strategy. And then we look, we, if we choose N, we get 2.5. If we choose A, we get 1.45, 2.5 is better. 
Let me repeat for the other option. So a best reply function tells us our optimal choices for any kind of our opponent's choice. So that is the meaning of these circles and squares. And we should find the Nash equilibrium here. We see it doesn't be, it's up here. Nash equilibrium is N N, meaning that Norway plays like Norway and Belarus plays like Norway, which is kind of the same situation we discussed in the textbook, meaning that Belarus mimics, mimics Norway here and chooses a, either a countermeasure type of strategy or a, a strategy which kind of resembles the Norwegian strategy to achieve a nicer outcome for themselves. One is better than 0 0.4. And we also discussed, uh, maybe it's asked for that in the latter parts here, can it be profitable for the end team to reduce their playing strength, strength for their preferred strategy? How much should in that case this playing strength be reduced? So here we kind of uh, go directly into what we discussed in the textbook. Is it sensible for the Norwegian team here to actually to become worse in playing their preferred strategy? So taking this number down at the same time lifting this number up such that this number is slightly bigger than 1.0. And we are actually asked to try to find it numerically here as well. So let's, let's look at that. We didn't do that in the text in the lecture. Uh, it's perhaps a misprint here someplace. Maybe I should. Mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, if you're good at mathematics, you can solve this as a kind of equational system, but I don't think I want to spend your time on that. So um, instead, let's assume we do some trial and error, okay, and try to look at. We, we kind of know here that in order to achieve this, we need to change this line. And this is the first line in the table on the top here, isn't it? That's the distribution of the quality difference between the teams when they play their preferred strategies. And what we're aiming for is making Norwegian worse, okay? So meaning that we take this number down somewhat and transfer that either to our opponent or to a combination of our opponent and the draw probability or only to the draw probability. It doesn't, uh, it's easiest perhaps to just transfer probability from this number into this. And let's look at the, the following example. If we change this one to 0 0.55 and we change this one to 0 0.35 and we keep this one unchanged, then of course we have taken 0 0.25 of probability mass here and moved it in there. So we have made no way worse. Certainly they are not as good as a team as they used to be. And of course, at the same time, relatively made Belarus a better team. Now, if we write up the consequence of using this one instead of this one, then we end up as follows, if I have made my calculations correctly. Of course, these three squares are not changed now, okay? This one only affects this first one. So they are as they used to be, 1.6, 1.0, 1.33, 1.33 and 1.45 and 1.45 here. So what's happening now is that we end up here with 1.65 and up here on 1.35. Of course you have to tr try and error a little bit to kind of find these numbers start with something and see what's happening and then increase it if it doesn't work and kind of that's that's uh, the simple way. Now if you look at Nash equilibria here you see that uh, 1.65 is bigger than 1.45, 1.35 is bigger than 1.0, this one is bigger than that one and this one is bigger than that one without any meaning here and of course you end up with this Nash equilibrium. And you see here 
that Norway comes at least slightly better out. Can you see that? You get 1.65 here. In the original one, we get got 1.6. Okay, so we get a little bit more, but we can of course get better out by adjusting even more here in the right direction. So we can perhaps take this one down a little bit. Just still, if you kind of want to optimize here, we can put try to achieve this one to be something like this. Slightly larger than that one, flipping it up, that would increase that one again, so you get more points on average. You see the point here. But, uh, we are kind of just asked to demonstrate that it's possible. And that is exactly what we have done. If you want to do this analytically, that shouldn't be too difficult, should it? Now if you take your 0 0.8 and you subtract something, let's call it x, okay? And we reduce something from this number. Then of course we added to the middle point. The same x plus x. So this is now the new probabilities for these two teams. And then we can calculate our expected value, can't we? Based on these variable concepts. So in that case, we would get something like 0 0.8 minus x for team 1 times 3, which is that. And then, of course, this one is solid. And for team 2, now we will get 0 0.1 plus x times 3 plus 0 0.1 times 1. So these are now the expected payoffs for the two teams as a function or the amount we need to reduce these to kind of end up as we want. And what we want to do now is to compare the expected payoff for the Belarusian team, which is this one, and we want to make it exactly equal to 1, don't we? Or actually a tiny bit bigger than 1. In that case, we are able to flip the equilibrium from this point up here. Now we can solve this equation, can't we? It's 0 0.1 times 3, which is 0 0.3 plus 3x plus 0 0.1 should equal 1. What do we get here? 0 0.3 plus 0 0.1, that is 0 0.4, isn't it? Move that, it's 1 minus 0 0.4, it should be 0 0.6 here. And we have 3x here, so x should be 0 0.6 divided by 3. That is the strategy of changing the Norwegian performance in such a way that they achieve the highest possible expected point score. But while at the same time being sure that the Nash equilibrium forces Belarus to play their preferred strategy and not the mimicking strategy. So this is one way of doing this, the other way is kind of just testing out. Okay, so this would, would produce, I don't know what this becomes. 0 point something. Yeah. Do, do you have a calculator? 0 0.6 divided by 3, can anybody compute that? Yeah, it should become 0 0.2, you're right. So we should change 0 0.8 to 0 0.6 then. That would be the optimal way of doing this, not to 0 0.55. You can test it if you like. Hopefully this logic is, is correct. Okay, that ended this final exercise set. And now we're into the even more boring part, which is kind of going through previous exams. Okay. So we continue that after the break, I think, and then we continue that next week. And then we are kind of finished, more or less. Okay, so let's take a 15 minutes break and be back at 12.10.